Thank you to the organisers of this event. I'm very happy to participate and to speak with you about national design histories in an age of globalisation and transnational possibilities in design history. Um, this event asks a number of important questions, including how can a national approach contribute to a design historiography in an age of globalisation? How can national design histories reflect transnational and local processes? And how can they be embedded in a global discourse on design history? And I'm going to address each question in turn um, with a view to stimulating discussion. Victor Margolin referred to his world history of design as a personal excursus. The world history displays his preoccupations as well as his expertise. So I think it's not inappropriate to begin my talk today with a brief personal origin story for the ideas about national and transnational histories of design which follow. In addition, Shetel Fallon and I have argued for the value of recognising subjectivities in our work as design historians. We propose that this rigorous subjectivity is more accurate than a design history which purports to be wholly objective. On the slide, I'm showing you other landmark publications that seek to provide a world history of design in different ways. Um, both of those are team efforts. Um, the History of Design, edited by Pat Kirkham and Susan Weber, and Global Design History, edited by Glenn Adamson, Giorgio Rieo and Sarah Teasley. So, the first question, how can a national approach contribute to a design historiography in an age of globalisation? I'm showing you Philippe Stark's sketches for Juicy Salaf for Alessi. The curriculum for my first degree in English literature, 1991 to 4, was undertaken in a progressive department and comprised core courses on the literary canon, literary and cultural theory, and optional courses. My choices of options included um, writing by women, African-American women's writing, and feminist literary theory, um, because my intellectual preoccupation as a young woman was gender. And I carried this preoccupation into my MA in the history of design, at the Royal College of Art in London, where I researched an 18th century working woman's corset and wrote a gender analysis of the college for its um, centenary. For my MA dissertation, I wanted to examine biomorphism in design, but this idea was rejected um, because it was felt to be a design studies topic, not a design historical topic. Instead, I researched a prime producer of biomorphic design at that time, the Italian household goods company Alessi. I conducted a wide series of interviews with designers, manufacturers, retailers, curators and consumers of Alessi um, and others, journalists, etc. And I became most interested while I was doing these interviews in Cruzanello in northern Italy, in Milan, London and Brighton in the stories surrounding the design, production, retailing, curating and consuming of Alessi objects. My dissertation and the uh, resultant publications used close reading of Alessi catalogues and vanity publishing to identify what Roland Barthes termed Italianicity or Italianita. I saw this Italianita in three in, uh, aspects of Alessi. Firstly, the interplay of mass production and craft techniques. Secondly, the extended design process. And thirdly, the central importance of family. Yet, um, Alessi's output, like Italian design more broadly, is the work of an international group of designers and is sold to consumers internationally. 
So not only does Alessi manage to be quintessentially Italian and international at once, I argue that Alessi's Italian eater is best understood from an Archimedean vantage point outside Italy. An Archimedean point is defined by Merriam-Webster's unabridged dictionary not only as a reliably certain position or starting point that serves as the basis for argument or reasoning, but also as a detached position or point of view from which to perceive and deal with a subject objectively. It's that second definition that I'm using today. And my understanding of it comes from my undergraduate reading of Myra Jelen's article, Archimedes and the Paradox of Feminist Criticism of 1981, which was anthologized in a textbook, um, Feminisms, 1991, that I read um, during my first degree. While there are some overlaps, an Archimedean point is not the same as the widely discussed outsider perspective used in anthropology and other fields. The latter has implications of relative knowledge or ignorance that the Archimedean point lacks. Um, it's a tool for um, distanced analysis. One of the proudest moments of my career was when I found myself quoted in Merriam-Webster's Unabridged Dictionary, as you can see on the slide, explaining um, the Archimedean point, or demonstrating it uh, anyway, at the use of the term. So, it's through interrogating the mediating discourses using the Made in Italy label that we see how some of Italy's products are presented as distinctively Italian, whether for the British audiences I've studied or for others internationally. In my work on Italian design, I've identified a tendency to privilege the acts of ideation and design rather than the processes of manufacturing, mediation and consumption in determining the provenance of goods. So by challenging the production emphasis of made in Italy, we can see that narratives as well as goods are made in Italy. Made in Italy is therefore made through the mediation of design as well as through manufacturing. In Made in Italy, Rethinking a Century of Italian Design, which I co-edited with Chettle Fallon, we suggest that the growth of global cultures constitutes a mandate for national studies of design that are attentive to cultural exchange and international trade and influence. The national as a category of analysis has been a tried and tested genre for design history but overwhelmingly of the so-called Western industrialised nations. Just as the di design histories of a raft of countries beyond the Euro-American Euro nexus need to be written to facilitate recognition of the distinctive nature of these national design cultures and the interaction of these uh, nations with the rest of the world, so new national histories are needed for those nations which have received a disproportionate amount of design historical attention to take account of transnational interactions and to assist in the project of decolonizing design. Our book Made in Italy occupies the second group as the subtitle Rethinking a Century of Italian Design indicates the book seeks to provide a new contribution to the historiography based not only on recognising that Made in Italy is an international phenomenon in terms of its design and production, mediation and consumption, but also on emphasising non-elite everyday design. We're as interested in Jean's company Diesel's ironic advertising campaigns as we are in canonical designs and in um, the enormous trade fairs representing a range of industries from furniture to textiles, as we are in the much-discussed Triennale exhibitions. Having co-edited Made in Italy as a revisionist national history of a Western nation prominent in the design history canon, Seattle and I wanted to explore the place of national design histories beyond Italy in the age of globalisation, 
we did so with our book Designing Worlds. This book doesn't attempt to tell the national histories um, that are indicated in the 15 chapters that range across five continents um, in that book. Rather, the authors examine the methodological problems attendant upon writing national histories, such as the lack of historical evidence upon which to base a history of design in regions ranging from Latin America to South Africa to Scandinavia, as well as in the impact of international geopolitical developments upon national design histories. Designing, world de Designing Worlds demonstrates that both comparative history and transnational history rely on the nation as an entity and conceptual category, but also that the comparative method is essential for understanding the national. My newest book, Design and Heritage, The Construction of Identity and Belonging, co-edited with Rebecca Howes, moves the discussion into the field of critical heritage studies. As well as discussing the relationship between design and heritage, design history and heritage studies, this book shows how design forms, shapes and communicates heritage, demonstrating that heritage is designed and design has a heritage. So my answer to the first question today, how can a national approach contribute to a design histori historiography in an age of globalisation, is to recognise that the national is never merely national. In order to understand national design histories, it's necessary to adopt a transnational approach. In order to establish what is, for instance, Italian about Italian design, it's necessary to step outside of Italy, physically perhaps, but certainly intellectually, and to ask how Italian design differs from that of other nations and regions. Whether it does or not, in actuality, is another question, but the mediating discourses surrounding Italian design, or the output of any nation, form part of the process of the accretion of national identities in design, and they therefore provide evidence of this process for design historians. And I'm showing you the cover of design history and also a photograph of a border ceremony on the India-Pakistan border. My first example has shown how even national design histories need to be transnational. In answer to question two, how can national design histories reflect transnational and local processes? I'm going to again reflect on the development of some of my own work in tracing the utility of the transatlantic as a category of analysis using the case study of US and British design discourses. Following my MA, research into the ways in which Alessi was mediated to British consumers in the closing decades of the last century, I wanted to continue to explore the role of narrative in making meaning for design. As part of my undergraduate study of literature, I had taken a course in the origins of the novel. To help us understand the epistolary novel, that's a novel told through letters, our tutor showed us a 1930s how-to book about letter writing with unwittingly hilarious template letters that you could copy out with gaps that you could fill with the salient details of your situation. Remembering this, I turned to the curious genre of a vice literature for my doctoral research into um, domestic advice literature as design discourse. My motivation was to show how rich this body of text was for understanding the history of design. Presenting this research in progress at conferences revealed two sticking points. The first was a default question about how far the advice in these books was followed. My response was to model a method of using domestic design advice as a literary genre, read for its own sake, much as novels are. A second challenge came from those historians who thought it was inappropriate to discuss UK and US domestic advice books together, 
because those two nation states are different. And my justification for discussing them together comes from the primary sources. And I want to say that more about that in a moment. Before I do, though, I'll just say that I'm showing you on the left, the New York Herald Home Institute's America's Housekeeping book from 1941. And on the right, How to Make Your Home Smart by Mrs. Diana Bridges, published in the African Elephant book series in 1962. Researching domestic advice for what eventually became my research monograph, Design at Home, Domestic Advice Books in Britain and the USA since 1945, I was struck by inaccurate statements about periodization and content of the domestic advice genre I read in single nation studies. And I'm showing you one example, uh, Sarah Levitt's From Catherine Beecher to Martha Stewart, which is a very worthwhile text but falls down when it um, makes statements that are wholly from within the US. Um, so to assert, for example, that books of domestic advice originated in the 1830s is to ignore the European origins of the domestic advice genre and several centuries of writing and publishing activity in that genre before it developed in the US. The earliest domestic advice books published in the US were reprints of British titles. Subsequently, some adaptation occurred and then the need for distinctly US advice was recognised and catered for. Notwithstanding an emphasis on distinctly American advice since then, such as that promoted by Mary and Russell Wright in their Guide to Easier Living, there remains a great deal of overlap between the content of UK and US domestic advice books. After all, in the US, both the self-help genre and its main market, the middle class, have roots in Victorian Britain. And advice writers place such an emphasis on precedent that each new title provides advice which is only incrementally distinct from that which precedes it. For instance, I saw that not only was the servant problem of reduced numbers of workers available for domestic service a preoccupation of both US and UK domestic advice writers between 1920 and 1970, but also that the solutions offered were couched in very similar compound terms. While US etiquette expert Emily Post promoted Mrs. 3M1, hostess, cook and waitress at once, as a solution, British writers Anne Edwards and Drusilla Bafus described the efforts of the cook hostess, who is the cook, the waitress and the washer-up, as well as hostess. Advice books are intertextual, they refer to one another. Domestic advice literature is an especially self-referential self genre and individual texts bear the explicit influence of writers from the other side of the Atlantic, sometimes through direct quotation and name dropping and sometimes without reference to particular authors. For example, in 1937, Betty Allen and Mitchell Perry Briggs cautioned teenagers, those who gobble and grab are not Emily Posted. On this slide, I'm showing you um, the second printing of Emily Post's 1922 Etiquette, which became known as the Blue Book of Social Usage. And next to it, the US Postal Service's stamp celebrating Emily Post's Etiquette. There's been some discussion about the um, dinnerware chosen for that stamp um, in terms of national uh, um, identities in design. Um, but in any case, I think it's very appropriate that Emily Post should have a stamp. In 1954, Mary and Russell Wright's Guide to Easier Living complained that, subtly preached by that able evangelist Emily Post, the dear old dream dominates writing and merchandising concerned with the home. While in discussing dinner parties in her Pan Book of Etiquette of 1962, 
British writer Sarah McLean wrote, Times have changed since Mrs Beaton's day. When the intertextuality that characterises the domestic advice genre is conducted across national borders, such as that between the UK and the US, we see a UK-US transatlantic domestic dialogue. My chapter on the transatlantic domestic dialogue in Designing Worlds reviews some single nation and some comparative histories of domestic advice, including Linda Young's study of UK, US and Australian middle class ideals. I note that comparative analysis helps to alleviate the risk of erroneous periodization attendant upon extrapolating from a single nation case and the tendency to assume as evidence of national identity trends which are in fact international or transnational. American exceptionalism has now been thoroughly debunked, partly through the transatlantic turn in American studies, which displays what Janice Radway has termed bifocal vision, a capacity to attend simultaneously to the local and the global as they are intricately intertwined and a relational and comparative perspective. This work has cautioned scholars of the US about the need to recognise the vantage points from which they research, write and make judgments, and the context within which they do those things, as a way of avoiding a shift from the frying pan of nationalist myopia to the fire of universalising and totalising world views. This is hard work, as I reported to the Society for the History of Women in the Americas series on the British Association of American Studies blog, US Studies Online. A transatlantic focus meant that I had to work harder in some academic contexts to justify my methodology than I would have needed to had I adopted a more conventional national unit of study. I needed to be clear at each point in my book about whether my comments related principally to the UK, to the US or to both nations. When my analysis veered more towards the US, for example when talking about the development of home economics, or the UK, for instance when examining the waning of aristocratic influence in domestic advice discourses, I needed to explicitly state that this was the case and explain why. In this sense my study is not a thoroughly comparative one in that it doesn't continuously compare one nation with another across the topics broached. Rather, it's a transnational study in that it takes as its focal unit of analysis a region which extends beyond that of one nation to two and considers the relationship between those nations as exemplified in the material studied, in this case domestic advice books. To return to the second key question for our symposium, how can national design histories reflect transnational and local processes? One answer provided by my own work is that they can do so in comparative studies and more specifically using a dialogic model across national borders. Design, like any cultural form, is in part formed by local, regional and national conditions and in part operates under the influence of and in conversation with international actors and influences. As Seattle Fallon and I noted of the current state of the art in the historic historiography of nations, we now recognise that the local, regional, national and global operate in dynamic simultaneity. Recognising this makes it undesirable, if not untenable, to produce national design histories which fail to recognise national processes. My answer to the third question posed by the symposium, how can national design histories be embedded in a global discourse on design history, builds on my answers to the two previous questions. One, that the national is never merely national, it's always transnational. And national design histories require an outsider perspective or an Archimedean vantage point, and so they are necessarily transnational to some degree and two, that the national and transnational come together in comparative work, such as the dialogic model of my work on domestic advice literature. Both of the examples I've provided depend on what I've called the mediation turn in design history. 
In addition to the key questions of this symposium, a core question for me in preparing my response has been, does the mediation turn facilitate comparative work, and if so, how? I answer, yes, it does. By looking at the narrative surrounding Italian design and the ways in which it's mediated outside Italy, I've not only challenged the made, what is made, by whom, in Made in Italy, but I've also pointed to the utility of a method in which the output of one nation is understood through its consumption in another. There are other excellent examples of this approach, including work on Swiss design by Robert Lascar and Davide Fornari, and Kevin Davis on Finmar. Secondly, I've discussed my work on domestic advice literature understood as a literary genre. Using techniques of literary analysis, I've shown um, an intertextual transatlantic domestic dialogue between domestic advice writers, their texts um, also, which provides a clear data set as evidence and thereby justifies transatlantic analysis. Design comes to mean through processes of mediation. Mediating channels increasingly transcend political, cultural and geographical borders. See, for example, the way subscription streaming service Netflix is disrupting national television broadcasting to communicate internationally about design, for instance, with its series Abstract, as well as its other design documentaries. Consider the shift online of the design press and the role of comments which can come from anywhere where readers have internet access. One advantage of a design history attentive to mediating discourses is the way in which a mediation focus disrupts ideas about national identity and demands post-national design histories. So to answer this third question, how can national design histories be embedded in a global discourse on design history, I would recommend continued attention to the mediating discourses which surround design and which transcend national borders. And I'm showing you here the cover of um, Design Magazine um, and uh, a cover for Industrial Design Magazine. So thank you for um, listening today. I've included my email address so that you can send me questions, uh, comments, suggestions. Thank you. Bye.